Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon on behalf of the Mining Association of BC to chair this panel on mining excellence. And I'd like to thank you all for coming in and joining us because it's going to be a very exciting and informative discussion. The Mining Association of BC is supportive and aligned with the vision of this forum, which is to bring together First Nations, resource sector communities, service and supply leaders, all levels of government, with the goal of collaborating, sharing, exploring ways to promote prosperity for British Columbians through responsible development of our diverse resource sector. Mining plays an important role in the British Columbia economy. We contributed in 2017 over $859 million in payments to government, created over 10,000 direct jobs, and an additional 20,000 jobs in the supply and service sector. I have to say it's refreshing to be up north, where the communities know the value of the resource sector to our entire province. To get a sense of the province-wide impact of the industry, the Mining Association undertook a study this summer to look where the operating mines in the province were spending their money. We released this report in September under the banner One Province and One, One Economy. The study confirmed that mining isn't an activity confined to the northern and rural parts of our province. It's an industry that the entire province is working in and benefiting from. There are over 3,000 suppliers across the province that provide $1.35 billion worth of goods and services to BC mining operations. I think remarkably, 1,200 of those companies are in the lower mainland, from Abbotsford to West Vancouver, benefiting from over $460 million in spending. Mining, like all natural resource industries, benefits, from, benefits the whole province and the entire economy. We also lead the way in innovation. From Donald Hing's invention of the walkie-talkie at the trail smelter in 1937, to today's use of virtual reality in project development or autonomous vehicles working at mine sites, mining continues to innovate and lead the way. That's why it's so exciting to be here to moderate this panel today, to share with you some of the exciting innovations that are happening in mining. And to help me do that, we have an excellent panel. I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists alphabetically, and then we're gonna come up in different order um, and share their stories with you. So I'm gonna start with Chad Day. Chad is the president of the Taltan Central Government. I think most importantly though, Chad is the proud father of four growing children, three boys and one girl, um, of Taltan and Wet'suwet'en um, ancestry. So um, Chad is in his fifth year of service um, as the elected president of the Taltan Central Government and the spokesperson for the Taltan Nation. He originally took on this role in the summer of 2014 after graduating from law school, which made him the youngest elected leader in Taltan history at the age of 27 years old. Chad grew up in Smithers, BC, and the Taltan community where his father was born and raised, Telegraph Creek. He's a Bachelor of Arts in First Nations Studies and Political Science through the University of Alberta, as well as a Juris Doctorate in Law from the University of Victoria. President Day has led his people through several agreements with industry and the province, which were focused on impact benefits, revenue sharing, co-management, and ecological protection. Many of these agreements are unique to the Tall Ten Nation, and others have set new standards and precedents for First Nations across British Columbia. He was instrumental in securing long-term protection over the sacred headwaters, which act as the tributaries of the three iconic salmon-bearing rivers in the northwest British Columbia, the Stikine, Nass, and Skeena. Chad has become well-known as a diligent, collaborative, creative leader that knows how to communicate and negotiate effectively with multiple stakeholders. He spends considerable time improving inclusion, communications, governance, and capacity building throughout the Taltan Nation. Our next panelist is Charles Levine. Charles is the CEO and co-founder of Lamazoo. Lamazoo is an interactive, award-winning software development studio that creates 3D data, visualization, and communication solutions for enterprise companies in Industry 4.0. Under his leadership, Lamazoo has grown from a lean startup to a profitable company with a valuation of over $25 million. 
To educate and advance the VRAR space, he's been called on to speak at numerous events, including South by Southwest, AWE, which is a recognized conference on AR and VR, PDAC, Disrupt Mining in 2018, and iVentures. Charles is a founding member of BC Tech's The Cube, a VR co-working space and incubator, and is a board member of the VRAR Association Vancouver chapter. Our third panelist is John Pumphrey, president of North Coal Limited. You may have heard John a little bit earlier today, but John's been with North Coal, and they are a sponsor of this conference for nearly six years, guiding the business from its initial days as a small, early-stage exploration company through to today's position as an emerging hard-coking coal, coal producer. John has over 20 years' experience in both the mining sector from roles in the oil sands operations and in the Elk Valley coal mines. John's focus in the near future is to bring North Coal's hard-coking coal product to global markets and to support the growing demand for steel. Last but not least, we have Terry Smith, and Terry is the Vice President of Operations with Coor Mining Incorporated. Terry was named Vice President of Operations with Coor in November 2018. He joined Coor in 2014 as the Vice President of North American Operations. Prior to Coor, he served as the Vice President of Project Development with Hunter Dickinson. Terry has managed projects ranging from feasibility level to coordinated field investigations, laboratory testing and engineering design. He has significant experience in strategic project planning and due diligence reviews for potential acquisitions, including environmental, metallurgical, geotechnical, and mining inputs. Terry has also served as the manager of operations for Barrett Gold Corporation in Toronto and as a senior mining engineer with Tech Cominco. He holds a Bachelor of Mining, a bachelor of mining Engineering from Laurentian in Sudbury, Ontario. What an amazing panel we have, and I think it would be great if we get underway. We are gonna try a little bit of a different format. We're gonna keep the presentations short, aiming for five minutes, allowing time for questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask Charles to join me at the, at the podium. Thanks everybody. Um, it's not going to be quite five minutes, I don't think, but uh, I'm going to try to make it interesting. So as mentioned, my name is Charles Veen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Lamazoo Interactive. Uh, and I know most of you, your top question is probably, where did the name Lamazoo come from? Uh, while that's a very interesting story, I want to tell a different story. Uh, and it's a story about innovation, discovery, uh, and my company's journey over the last four and a half years. Uh, so in my prior career, I used to work uh, as a video game designer. Uh, and that wasn't, uh, uh, you know, in the basement, as mentioned earlier by the Premier, but actually for the largest developers and publishers in the world, including Microsoft, Electronic Arts, and Ubisoft. Uh, and my co-founder was as well. Uh, and we were literally making some of the biggest games uh, with, you know, 20, 50, 60, 120 million dollar budgets uh, but it wasn't gratifying at, at the end. And, you know, we were using all these technologies like real-time simulation and incredible GPU real-time uh, rendering. And what we wanted to do was actually take the expertise that we had developed in this industry and apply it to real-world challenges for industries. In the end, our games were played by something like 50 million gamers. Small little stat, but we're quite proud of that. And in 2014, my co-founder and I started Lamazoo uh, and uh, with the mission of creating a platform to distribute real-time 3D data uh, to the world. Uh, and so we set on, on this hard, long entrepreneurial journey, you know, which included hiring our first staff, finding investors that believed in our vision, uh, you know, finding offices, incorporating, setting up retention plans for employees because it's a startup, you know, you have to have a reason to, to stay with the startup. Uh, all the while growing and developing our technology and our first products. Now the funny thing here is that, uh, and this is really common for a lot of early stage startups, we didn't know that we were building the wrong product. We thought we were building the right product. And what we were building was actually educational tools for the me veterinary medicine sector. Uh, and 
what that looked like was visualizing the canine cadaver at the utmost goriest, most realistic, medically accurate detail. Uh, and it was successful by all accounts. Uh, you know, we sold to t some of the top universities, including UPenn, UCD Dublin, uh, University of Oregon. In the end, we partnered with 10, and today that product is used in over 120 universities around the world with over 10,000 users. Uh, so it's arguably one of the de facto veterinary uh, training uh, software tools available out there. But what, what happened was is we created the best product that we thought the industry needed, and we launched it, and then we watched. And we worked diligently to get the word out and work with industry to figure out how to increase adoption. It was really difficult. Um, what we found when we took a step back, we kind of analyzed what did we build here? What is this actually? Uh, and what it was is that there was this element of technology being applied to data. And the realization was that medical imaging is actually big data. And so what we did is we started looking at other industries around the world for big data. And it didn't take us long to look in our own backyards in BC at the natural resource sector to see that there was an exorbitant amount of data that had been collected historically and that continues to be collected. And so this was the kind of the, the, the progression of innovation going from game development to veterinary uh, education to natural resources was the application of and the realization of these technologies applied to a sector that we weren't anticipating that allowed us to find something that was really uh, tangible and beneficial to an industry. And when we reached out to industry, we actually found a very warm reception uh, with companies like Tech Resources, Bert Gold, and Gold Corp, where they were very interested in applying these innovations to their sector to find new efficiencies and uh, you know, different operational insights that they could derive. And that crossover, uh, sorry. Yeah, so uh, this kind of launched us into our next chapter where we're now dedicated to serving and partnering with companies globally in the natural resource sector, including mining, forestry, and oil and gas but most importantly, at home in BC, where we plan to stay and grow for years to come. Now, I've been doing a lot of talking, not a lot of showing, and I want to show you guys a sample of what we do best um, and what Lamazoo does for these sectors. So if you could just play the uh, video. As you can see, Lamazoo is changing the way the world literally sees data. And today we provide a platform that enables spatial business intelligence to the industry. And what that means is that we're working with these companies to visualize some of the most remote and harshest mining environments around the world, find, helping them find holes in their data, helping them derive operational excellence and efficiencies, accelerating stakeholder alignment, reducing rebuild in the design stages, and saving millions of dollars in the process through reducing travel and other cost savings such as annual lease hold fees. Or how in 2019 we're going on a mission to work with the forestry industry to save two to three dollars per cubic meter in the coastal forestry region. We're very excited about the potential there. And that's just to start. So I want to thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions in the panel.
if you go to the website for Lama Zoo, you'll find out that Charles is in fact the chief Lama. So I had wanted to mention that in his intro. Um, next, I'd like Chad to come up and tell us about the innovative things that are happening in terms of consultation in the Taltan First Nation. Chad Norman Day Ushia, Siskias Dotsehi, Norman Day S. Tup, Tleguin, Naste, Ethenius Tumetu Jaate. My name is Chad Day. Norman Day is my father. He's in the front row. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Sean Descharm is in the crowd somewhere, and Sean's one of our newest uh, Taltan Central Government employees. So, welcome to the team, Sean, and I just want to make sure that you're acknowledged. Um, I come from Telegraph Creek, and in the intro, you, you heard a little bit about my history. When we talk about the, uh, the innovation of the Taltan Nation, I think it's, it's very important to um, just give you some context. Uh, I'm the spokesman for 11% of British Columbia. Taltan Nation is, is vast. We have uh, three active projects, mining projects in our territory. We have uh, Bruce Jack Mine, Red Chris Mine, and then we have the Silver Tip Mine. Uh, Taltans have been mining since time immemorial. My kids bought me this, uh, this obsidian necklace. I wish I could say it was from the Taltan Nation, but we got it when we were in California <laughs> over the, uh, the holiday. But I thought, you know, this is extremely symbolic because it's... Uh, it's an obsidian necklace, but it's wrapped in, you know, modern-day copper as well. And uh, Taltans have been mining since time immemorial from the obsidian. Uh, my father and his father uh, worked in mining camps for, uh, you know, many decades in Taltan territory. Obviously, all the technical people and geologists know our area quite well. We have the highest employment of any mine site for uh, First Nation group in the province. Uh, Red Chris is uh, usually around 30% Taltan. We have over 150 Taltans working there from year to year. And then when you take into consideration the other projects that are in shared areas, so we share the employment with, uh, with other First Nations, we have about 200 members in um, those active projects. And then from the exploration industry, from year to year, depending on uh, how well you guys are, are doing at raising money out there. I know it's getting uh, quite challenging at times. We have about another 100 members in the exploration industry from, from year to year. All of that uh, combined creates uh, about $20 million for Taltan people to help them support their families. That doesn't include some of the entrepreneur contracts and some of the contracts that we have through the Taltan Nation Development Corporation. When people ask me why the Taltan Nation has been so successful with um, getting agreements in place with industry, it's, uh, it's complicated, but it's simple. First Nations normally support mining when mining supports First Nations, but it's obviously a two-way street you need to do your work as leadership and as communities to build your capacity to put your people, to put your youth, to put your communities in a position to benefit. You need to make sure that uh, they're getting educated, that they're working closely with the industries, that they understand what the opportunities are. And when it comes to something like impact benefit agreements, which um, I think is top of mind after you know what's been happening in in Wet'suwet'en territory, and that obviously hits me in a tender place because my, uh, my children live there and, and they come from there and I grew up there. Uh, what I've been explaining to people is that how we do things in the Taltan Nation, and I, I guess you would call it innovative because I know other nations don't quite do things the same way, but we just really hammer down on the, what I call interconsultation with our people as much as possible. We have about 4,000 members. Uh, we, have about we have addresses for about 2,200 of our adult members that are able to vote. Um, of those 2,200, I would say 1,500 are very involved with the nation. We're very inclusive, so everybody with Taltan ancestry, regardless of their status, non-status, belonging to another band, 
uh, we allow them to, we, we communicate with them, we have meetings with them. Although Taltan Nation only has 20% of our people within our traditional territory, we take the view that uh, all Taltan people collectively own the rights, the title to our area, and for that reason, all Taltan people should have a say when it comes to having major uh, impacts on those, those rights and on the territory back home. So our process is to go out to, believe it or not, 16 different communities. I will physically go out to 16 different communities with industry, with our lawyers, with our negotiators, with our technical team. We're lucky enough that we have many educated, um, experienced people like Sean that um, are part of that team. We call it the, it's actually called the threat team. It's the Taotan Heritage Resources Environmental Assessment Team. And that's a team that's been in place for over a decade. And we have our own members leading that team. And we have some non Taotan members on that team as well. But we have our own technical team to communicate with our members. We go out to 16 different locations. 12 of those locations are outside of our traditional territory. We go to um, 14 in British Columbia, one in the Yukon. We go over to, to Edmonton in Alberta. We even go up to the, the mine sites so that our people get that face-to-face -face so that we disclose everything that we can to them. We answer those questions and it really builds up the trust. Once we get the go-ahead from our people to support something, uh, the next piece is to uh, get a negotiation term sheet in front of them, and eventually it ends with a, uh, a ratification vote by, by all Taotan people. We work closely with the local band councils, we work closely with the youth, we work closely with the elders, and at the end of the day, we don't have to argue about who had a say or what leader is in charge and not in charge, because it's a, it's a decision that came down to the nation level. So I won't, uh, I know that there's a whole bunch more questions, but I wanted to just explain that because I think uh, that's probably the most innovative thing that we do is that we have a very, very thorough, inclusive process that respects all Taotan people to, to have a say and to truly arm them with the ability to make prior informed decisions. Madhu. Thank you, Chad. Through technological innovation and consultation, core mining has reopened and is some exciting plans underway for the silver tip mine up north in British Columbia. So I'd ask Terry to join me um, at the podium and tell us about what's new at core mining. Thanks. Uh, my name is Terry Smith. Uh, I'm with Core Mining. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations, so I look after um, all the operations. I'll be talking about Silvertip um, today, which is a mine that we uh, recently uh, commenced operations, uh, and uh, it's located outside of Watson Lake. Cautionary statements from our legal team. <laughs> yeah. Can't get away from that, huh? Um, so here's a, a geographic mix of, of our operations. Um, I actually uh, I grew up in Canada. I've worked in, uh, in British Columbia, but I'm actually living in Chicago at the moment. That's where our corporate office is. Uh, we have five operations, including Silvertip, I mentioned, up in northern British Columbia. We have uh, Kensington, just outside of Juneau, Alaska, Rochester um, in northern Nevada, and Wharf in South Dakota, and uh, our Palmerail mine down in Mexico. So we're a, a precious metals company, um, uh, and, uh, uh, which means we produce uh, gold and silver. Um, we have a mix of lead and zinc uh, that uh, come along with um, silver tip, which is kind of new for us. Uh, we're a US-based uh, listed company on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we're actually a very old company. Uh, we're 95 years old. Uh, it, it's a um, company, the, the name actually comes from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The company was based there, and, and six, seven years ago, the company relocated to Chicago. So it's a bit of the history. Um, this slide is a, um, 
kind of our operating system <laughs> for, for the company. I'm not going to go into all the granular details sort of on the, on the right of the slide. I'll, I'll kind of refer more to the left uh, under the protect, develop, and deliver. Those are the sort of the tenets that we operate within. Uh, by protect, we, we really talk about the people that work for our company uh, and the environment that we, that we operate in. Um, by develop, we're looking for quality resources, quality assets to purchase, and we're thinking about the future of our company. And by deliver, we're delivering good business results, as all public companies want to do. Uh, a couple of the things that uh, I'll highlight just kind of in the middle, because um, I think some of the interest here is, uh, uh, you know, an, an American mining company opening a, a mine in British Columbia. Uh, why would we want to do that? Um, well, that's, uh, we looked at British Columbia as a safe jurisdiction. Uh, we really, really liked um, the asset. I'll talk a little bit more about Silvertip specifically, but it's a, it's a great um, resource. and. Uh, in a, in, a, in, a, uh, uh, in a province that we know we can do business in. Canada is a very resource friendly country and, and, and BC is no different. Um, we, uh, uh, we also, in the, just sort of down the list, we've got this uh, create value through exploration piece. Uh, Silvertip has is, is been sort of explored in fits and starts over the years. We just, we're really excited about the exploration potential of this property. We hope that uh, this is a mine that's going to be operating not just for five or ten years, but um, for decades. So this is um, pretty exciting, uh, and we're just getting started with the asset. Um, for those of you that know CORE, this is um, sort of how we used to look back in 2010, and then how we look now more in 2018. And it's really meant to show our geographic mix. Back in 2010, we had mines in Argentina and Bolivia and Australia as well as the U.S. and Mexico, and so we were sort of spread all over the place. And I don't know if, um, if any of you have ever uh, operated a mine in Bolivia, but this is a, a pretty um, interesting place to do business. Uh, and uh, so we've, we've exited um, uh, Bolivia, we've exited Argentina, we sold our assets in, in uh, Australia, and now we're located in North America, including Canada. So this is a much um, tighter footprint and much safer jurisdictions for us to operate in. Um, this is uh, what we call ESG. ESG just stands for Environment, Social, and Governance. Um, what I wanted to highlight here is, is our investment in local communities and in the indigenous communities that we operate in, specifically here in British Columbia and the Yukon. Um, Silvertip's actually, uh, you know, a, a couple of kilometers from the uh, BC Yukon border. Uh, and as Chad was mentioning, uh, we're, uh, we're actively uh, in discussions with the Talton on how they can participate in, in our project. Uh, and I liked what uh, minister, uh, the Minister of the Environment said earlier, where it's not just um, uh, stakeholders, this is a partnership. That's how I, I like to look at it. The, uh, uh, the mine is an operation, uh, mines have a beginning and an end. Um, and these communities are gonna exist long past uh, our mining operations life, and we wanna leave a lasting legacy. Uh, we we wanna invest in these communities, and we wanna invest in businesses that are gonna support our operation and make our operation better. And, and certainly, um, in our short time uh, operating Silvertip, um, we've got a lot of interest uh, in along those lines. So I think there's great alignment with what we're seeing. Um, a little bit more specific about uh, Silvertip, it's an underground mine. We have a, a, a mill facility that concentrates um, our ore into two concentrates, a lead concentrate and a zinc concentrate. They make their way to Prince Rupert and Prince Stuart, uh, and they make their way over to Asia for sales. Um, we've got around 250 employees, uh, a significant number of those are indigenous people. I don't have the percentage. Uh, top of mind. Um, down on the right, we've got um, some, some numbers, and this is a little technical, but uh, you can see um, if you're in the mining industry like, uh, like I am, grade is what you focus on first, and, and you, we've got 10 ounce per ton silver, sorry, these are in imperial units, uh, uh, and uh, percentages of lead and zinc. This is a very high grade um, resource, and that's what really primarily inter interested us in this, in this project. 
So just a quick update on Silvertip. There's a nice scenic shot of, of our camp construction that's, that's going in. It's very near completion. Um, we're, uh, we, we purchased the mine back in October of 2017 for $200 million from a private equity group. Uh, and since then, we've been sort of finishing the construction and trying to ramp up operations. Uh, and we declared commercial production uh, at the mine in September of last year. Um, we declared our initial reserve um, on, on the project uh, just late last year in December, and, uh, and we're, um, which is sort of a maiden reserve. We're looking forward to building on that. As I said, we've got a lot of exploration potential, and uh, we've got many drill seasons ahead of us at, at Silvertip, so we're pretty excited from that perspective. Then we get more into uh, all kinds of great things that uh, our lawyers left in the presentation. But um, just in the in the under the innovation um, discussion, um, innovation is, is really part of our DNA in our little company. Uh, we have this motto in the company: we pursue a higher standard. And what that really uh, is, in, in my world, is this continuous improvement philosophy. And, and innovation is a way to realize continuous improvement. And whether you're talking about technology that uh, we were talking about earlier, or you're just talking about doing something better or safer, or, uh, or that's um, uh, you know, partnering with, uh, with uh, local communities in, in new and interesting ways, these are all innovative ways that, that, uh, that we think about the business. And, uh, uh, be happy to talk about more specific examples of, of how we're innovative in any kind of way. That um, specifically with Silvertip, it's a it's a uh, it's in its infancy. So I, I like to think that the innovation isn't really that uh, um, uh, amazing at the moment. We're we're just being innovative, just trying to ramp up a facility in the middle of nowhere. Um, so that's a. Uh, uh, but we do have uh, interesting plans for Silvertip to uh, automate, um, use big data, um, and, and to use machine learning to operate our, our mill facility in, in a very efficient way. So, uh, but um, right now I'm just waiting for my phone to ring telling me whether the mill's operating or not. So we'll start there. Um, so that's, uh, that's the extent of uh, my presentation. Look forward to the forum. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. As the globe, uh, eco global economy continues to grow and populations expand, we need more resources. To extract those resources in an innovative way just makes good business sense. And that's what North Coal intends to do. So I'd ask John to join me at the podium to tell us about North Coal's plans for Northeast British Columbia. Southeast British Columbia, I should say. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be the last speaker in the last panel of the day, and I promise the 48 slides I have to go through uh, will go quick. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't have slides. Um, innovation is is uh, is a very interesting topic for the for the you know the whole works of the of these three days. Uh, it's very implicit in everything we do, not just in the mining industry, but in our day-to-day -day lives. I think importantly, in and around innovation, you know, we, we, we ask ourselves, why is innovation important? F for some, they're looking at the bottom line, they're looking at a cost model, uh, and that's important. Uh, for me, I guess I'll start out with an example. Last year, last summer, I was out on the local river, the Elk River, in the Elk Valley, and uh, I was fly fishing with my two sons, and we're obsessive fisher folk in our family, and uh, on one of the occasions when I was having to change a fly, I had my rod tucked under my arm and uh, was taking the fly off because my success wasn't so great that day. Um, my youngest boy, Thomas, was upstream, and I've talked to him a lot about mining over the years, and they get a lot from school, and I try to educate him at home. He came downstream, and, and uh, you can see some of the mines if you go further up the Elk River. And, and he looked at me, and, and he said, Dad, is, is this new mine you're, you're looking at 
starting to make this water dirty. It kind of kind of stopped me in my tracks a bit. I was kind of in the midst of changing the fly and kind of put the fly back in the box, kind of, you know, dipped my hand in the water, took a look around, and I kind of started thinking a bit about, you know, really what we're trying to achieve. So I turned to my son and looked him pretty hard in the eyes, and I said, no, son, I promise you it won't. I promise you. And I gave him that assurance. And that really fueled, kind of fueled that fire within myself and, and really within our company. So that's one of the, one of the drivers in my life uh, in and around innovation in the Elk Valley and in mining in general is to improve our performance, improve what we do day to day, and to ensure that the mining industry, in particular in British Columbia, uh, are world leaders in everything we do. I talked to you a bit earlier uh, about our company. Uh, we're looking at developing, not developing, we're looking at uh, starting a, a hard coking coal, steel making coal uh, mine in the Elk Valley. The Elk Valley is very diverse. It offers mining. You can go to a mine site one day. You can ski from the top of a mountain the next day. You can fly fish later in the season. Um, there's a very diverse group of people there. Uh, we work very closely with the communities and those people. We also work very closely with the Tanaha First Nation. When I came into the role in 2013, uh, the company at the time was led uh, by a group out of country, and uh, I think their understanding of what the, the real issues were may have been lacking. Uh, when I stepped on the ground day one, uh, my priorities were to build a strong relationship both personally and working-wise with the Tanaha First Nation, to build our relationship with the communities, but then to address the, the legacy issues associated with mining, not just in our region, but throughout the province. So before the first exploration drill hole even went in the ground, I was thinking about how can we mine coal, meet the global demand for coal, but ensure that we're not creating negative impacts to the environment. I gathered a team uh, throughout those first two years whom I'd met in the, my previous 20 years of mining. Uh, my background is an environment, uh, so I didn't bring the mining engineer perspective to the table, but I gathered a group of people together, world experts in and around water, geotechnical, um, air, reclamation, First Nations, communities, and I put, the que excuse me, I put the question to the group, how can we design a mine that is world-class, leading, does not have an impact on the environment, and involves the local First Nation, communities, and is, ha has a positive legacy? Uh, we, so when we talk about innovation, those were, that, those were some of the first steps in our, in our pathway to, to developing and, and getting to where we are today. Through, those la through these last six years uh, and through a lot of innovative thinking and processes, we've developed and designed uh, a mine and a facility that addresses the water quality and the water quality concerns that we're hearing about in British Columbia, in particular in the Elk Valley. It, ad it addresses air, air quality. It talks about, you know, it, ad it addresses things such as the reconciliation, working very closely in partnership with the First Nations. It involves the communities. Uh, and all of the concerns that you, that you see from all those groups and beyond. So, you know, recon uh, sorry, innovation is, is part of what we do. It's part of our everyday lives. It'll continue to be part of our everyday lives. And uh, I think the mining industry in general uh, are, are, you know, part of that, le that leadership group in and around innovation. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to a successful operating mine site with, uh, you know, collaboration, as I said, in relationships with our communities, our First Nations, and a positive legacy to, to the region and, and to the province and the country. Thanks very much for your time, and uh, look forward to your questions. Um, so thanks to the panelists for your excellent presentations and for keeping them relatively short. So we do have some time for interaction with the audience and question and answers. Um, you know, this forum is about learning and um, learning from each other. So um, I want to start with some questions of my own and maybe with Charles. You know, mining is a historic industry in this province. We've been mining forever. 
Um, what's been your experience about mining and miners adopting new technology? And what lessons would you have um, for mining companies? Well, uh, I, our experience has been very positive. I mean, there's been, I think we're at a point now where there is a demand and, uh, you know, uh, a need for innovation and change because, uh, you know, with the global economy, it's more competitive. Uh, there's a lot of M&A activity and, uh, you know, it's, companies have to find ways to differentiate their, their bottom line. Um, what we've found is that taking a very educational approach, uh, you know, working with, uh, we don't call them clients, we don't call them customers, we, everybody we work with is a partner. Uh, so we partner with uh, who we work with and we help educate them on the technologies that we develop and that we use and figure out how to best uh, apply those technologies within their organization. You know, there is no one size fits all in, in enterprise technology. So it's, it's really about kind of collaborating and communicating and doing those kind of sessions to understand what data they have, what challenges they have, where they're operating, you know, who are the local communi communities and First Nations and um, yeah, working together and resolving that. Great, thank you. And, and keeping an open mind. Yeah, absolutely. Chad, the Taliban central government has been a leader in consultation. What lessons would you want to share with other, with project proponents and maybe with other indigenous nations around consultation and how to ensure comprehensive consultation? Well, on the proponent side, I guess I would say that uh, you want to start that relationship really early. I would say that you probably want to take some some risks with uh, you know signing different kinds of agreements and getting out of your comfort zone, going into the to the communities, getting to to know some people. I know that we have some exploration um, partners that signed agreements with us that other companies originally said no, we've we've never done something like this. We don't want to, and then later on down the road, you realize that by having that closer relationship with us. It's easier to get investor dollars. It's easier to work through things with government because rather than having to kind of organize this relationship with three or four different people, you're suddenly true partners going to government together to hold government accountable, going to the investment bankers together to talk about uh, how your territory is, is a good fit, uh, these kind of pieces. When it comes to, to First Nations, I think some of the big issues I see, obviously you can't always control the capacity. Uh, I come from a nation that's been mining for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, a guy like George Asp, uh, rest his soul, was one of the first First Nation lawyers in this country, and he came back and helped us establish our central government to the place where it is today. Um, my government, the Taliban central government, it's not a government that was created through treaty. It's not a government that was created through the Indian Act. We've been carving this thing out ourselves since the 70s. So not every community is going to have that. But what I would say is uh, if they do have that, really try and bring your own people into the, the governance as much as you can. Try and bring those high capacity individuals. Set aside whatever family differences or whatever you may have because when those high capacity individuals are uh, from your own nation and they're the ones explaining these things. If you have somebody that can, you know, explain the environmental pieces and do your negotiations, if you have your own lawyer, even if they're not calling the shots but they're involved, that really brings a whole new comfort. And um, communication, communication, communication. Uh, obviously, I'm a, I'm a younger guy. I utilized Facebook to get elected. I run into a lot of older leaders that say, oh, you know, that social media is just a a gong show all the time and it's true it is and it's caused me major problems but you know what the young people your people are on social media if you can't adapt and start using things like social media to get that message out it's a constant battle nowadays you know all of us have seen the, um, the crap that we have to go through because one person behind a, a keyboard has created a story and it just gets out of control so we need to combat that and uh, really step up our game as First Nations, as industry, to get out there, to get our message out there, to get our, to, to make it easier, you know, get out to the basketball games if you have to, get out to the, 
to the bingo halls and to the feast and create videos that are only two or three minutes in length and put them on Facebook. Do whatever you have to do to combat all that ignorance that's constantly on social media, not only from within our, our own nation sometimes, but from NGOs and other groups that do not have First Nation best interests at heart and obviously cause us all a lot of problems. So I would say communication, communication, communication. And uh, I could go on all day, but pass it on. Thank you. Well, I mean, that really is the essence of innovation, too, is being open to doing things differently and being open to new ideas. So. Um, and innovation is something that Core Mining is planning on bringing to Silvertip. You, you've learned, um, I'm sure, a lot of um, new things for, or things from your mines in other jurisdictions. Can you talk a bit about the innovations you may be bringing? I'm sure. forward to British Columbia, Terry. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, the opportunities uh, around innovation, um, some of the, I'll talk about some of the technological aspects of innovation that we're focused on. Um, and I'll name three, actually. Automation, uh, big data that one, Charles is talking about an aspect of that, uh, and then machine learning. And automation, I think everybody's kind of seen uh, in the media um, tr cars that can drive themselves. Um, it's really not that different in the mining industry. You have trucks driving themselves. You have uh, uh, loaders loading themselves. You have drills drilling by themselves. And uh, I don't necessarily look at it as a way um, to use automation to reduce labor. I, use, I, I think of it as our, our industry is, is hazardous, and this is a way to uh, make it safer and more efficient. Uh, so automation is something that we're, we're focused on, and, and it's, it's something that has really developed in the last uh, number of years in, in the mining space. Um, with big data, uh, the, the ability to get uh, instrumentation and information across your, your operation and be able to amalgamate it and, and dashboard it um, has become extremely easy. Um, when I was um, a young engineer, I... I would spend hours just copying and pasting and merging and creating graphs and spreadsheets, and now all of that is virtually automatic if you can um, have, the, have a good IT team. Um, and uh, so that's an area where we um, are focused and, and we plan on implementing at Silvertip, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll just run a tighter, more efficient operation. And the last is uh, uh, machine learning, or people call it AI as well. And, uh, but to me, this is one of uh, uh, the operators explained this to me a couple of weeks ago, and it just kind of resonated. Uh, imagine if you could have uh, the best operator that runs your plant um, all the time. Because um, as anybody in operations knows, you have uh, the day shift, uh, they run great, and then the night shift, not so great. And why is that? Uh, uh, imagine if you had a, a computer that's looking at um, how your plant's operated and, and making those adjustments to make that plant operate as efficiently as it can every shift. And then the operators are, are more um, doing preventative maintenance. Um, they're, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, t um, um, looking at uh, bottlenecks and debottlenecking those parts of the plant. Uh, and, and they're not necessarily sitting at a control station adjusting knobs and, and, and doing this kind of thing. They're, they're doing more productive work. So machine learning, I think, is a way that uh, we can run our facilities more efficiently. So those are the three areas that we're focused on. Yeah. Thank you. And John, my final question for you is, my understanding is that North Coal is proposing to bring in the best available technologies um, to your mine design. And that this may not have been done before, but you have some confidence in, in doing that. So can you talk a bit about why you're taking this um, less than utilized approach or maybe well, I'm I, with that. I think I think mining companies in general today bring in best available technologies I you know our neighbors are world leaders in terms of what they do on both mining but on on social and environmental aspects of their projects so I wouldn't say we're we're light years ahead however we do have some advantages in terms of being a new mine and not having you know long legacy issues. So when we, and, and I know your, your question, Lindsay, is specific to, to managing the environmental components. And, 
and I spoke to it a little bit earlier, but the methodologies that we have chosen to ensure we're managing water, we're managing air, um, in particular water and air, uh, have been tested around the world um, in, in, different, in different manners and in different components. So they all haven't necessarily been tested together, but you know, our, our ologists, our grand teams of brains, um, and we have very good teams uh, and, and have worked closely with us, uh, are very confident that in bringing those two, three key components to managing air and water together, that we can meet, you know, social regulatory uh, requirements of today and, and into the future. Because I think that's a key piece is, you know, our regulatory regimes are, are continually changing and we're always having to adapt. And part of being innovative is, is not just looking at the, the challenge of today, it's thinking outside the box about what it will be in five, ten years and, and having some idea of, of, of what could go wrong and what kind of mitigation measures you have to manage that risk and ensure that it doesn't go wrong. So I'm quite confident that the technologies we have in place for managing rock, water, air uh, will meet those requirements and that you know, our closure plans and our long-term legacy will leave a very positive legacy in our area. Great. Well, now over to the audience. It looks like, um, Chad, you've got um, a lot of interest in understanding whether um, you've had requests from other First Nations to show how the Talton successful innovation around consultation has worked, and would you consider, if asked, um, talking about that to other First Nations? It would seem to be of value to all. Yeah, well, one, one issue with First Nations is that we don't always get along that well, and uh, <laughs> the truth is we've, uh, we've made a lot of strides in the last decade, and I can tell you that uh, I'm really excited about doing a lot more work with uh, the Nishka Nation to the south, our neighbors to the south. We recently won a Premier's Award actually for innovation. Maybe that's why you guys asked me on to be on this panel, because uh, we, we won a, an award, a Premier's Award for innovation with the uh, Casca and the Clinket, because we're doing a lot of work with our, our children and youth. And once you have success there, you realize, wow, we can be doing work in other places like with uh, with wildlife and with education and these kind of pieces. So I won't go too far off, but uh, the truth is, is that when it comes to governance and our expertise with mining, we have not uh, had a lot of requests from other First Nations, but I saw the second part of the question is would we be willing to? Um, I, w I would love to, to help other First Nations because, you know, there are brothers and sisters when they're stronger, we're all stronger together. I spend a lot of time between Terrace and Smithers, as well as Vancouver and Victoria. So, you know, I would be more than happy to, uh, to connect with people. And I have a particular uh, passion for, for working with younger people, because I believe they, like myself and some of my team, will be the ones to really bring things to, to the next level. So I would uh, be honored to do that. That's great, and even coming and serving on this panel today as a way to educate not only our proponents but also other Indigenous communities about how, how you can lead successful consultations. So if we move to the next question, I'm looking forward, what would be the three most innovative technologies, does the panelists think, that will change mining, the mining sector in the next five years, and specifically remote mines, where limited access and limited grid connections to power, the power lines exist? So uh, open up to whoever wants to jump in first. Charles. I mean, I don't operate a mine, but I know a bit about technology. I think uh, <clears throat> 5G connectivity is going to be huge. Uh, it's really going to allow a whole new paradigm of uh, bandwidth in remote uh, regions and also the amount of data that we'll be able to collect. So if we think there's big data today, uh, in five years, big data is going to be massive data. Uh, and as part of that big data, you'll need machine learning to process it and data visualization to better understand it. So I think those are kind of the three uh, core pillars of uh, what Industry 4.0 is really going to look like in the next five years. Any other panelists want to? It's a good question. Um, certainly automation, when you look at remote sites, or, or you know, that's something that's being tested on a commercial scale in, in, the, in Western Canada. 
Um, you know, I spoke to partnership with First Nations. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, First Nations live all throughout the province of BC in, in remote areas. So building the training programs, the skills, the opportunities for the First Nations, that would support mining in remote locations quite strongly. And I think the province is making and the companies are making great strides in that. Um, and I'm stuck for a third, but uh, I'll turn it over to maybe Terry has. Terry will give you the third, maybe. Yeah, well, I, I, was, I was mentioning uh, automation and, and big data uh, and machine learning as well. Uh, uh, those are, th those are the, there, the areas we're focused on. I do think they're transformational. And, and just the automation piece, uh, you know, we operate outside of Watson Lake. We could have um, operators in Watson Lake operating equipment um, at Silvertip uh, two hours away. Um, you know, so that's a, a more efficient use of an employee's time. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, they're not, uh, not sleeping in a camp setting. Um, they're sleeping at home. Um, and, you know, obviously you can never get away from having people at a, at a mine site. But, um, you know, that's a, that's a unique way that you can um, uh, operate in a remote environment like that is to have that tele-remote um, capability. So that's, that's something that we're looking at as well, which is sort of a, uh, a byproduct of, of having modern automatable equipment. So, yeah. Great. Thanks. Going back to the questions from our audience, um, what does innovation look like for securing environmental sustainability in BC? So the role of innovation in, in ensuring environmental sustainability in operations. Technologically. Yeah, I, well, I can, a few things come to mind there. Uh, it, it, it's again uh, along the, the, the same lines. Uh, um, we, uh, we operate within, uh, within our permits and, and those permits are air quality, water quality, uh, and an, plethora of other things and uh, uh, instrumenting a water well is a, is a good way to not have to have a person go out and sample that, that water well. Um, and uh, so it's a, sort of the same thing I was talking about before with big data. It's just a, it's another way of extending um, technology into the, um, into the operation, uh, whether it's a piece of equipment or, or a water well or, um, uh, you know, air quality monitoring, it, it's, those are all things that uh, could benefit from that. So um, in, in terms of sustainability, you know, that, that's what I was kind of referring to earlier when I was talking, I guess. Uh, um, you know, how do we, how do we build a, a, a capacity in the communities uh, around our operations um, so that uh, when the operation is no longer there, um, those communities continue to benefit. And that's, um, that's, I think, building strong partnerships. Um, the things that, that Chad's talking about, obviously, are, are fundamental to that. And, and having a, a, an open mind to um, how those partnerships um, work. Um, and, and it's not just a, here are the sets of rules and, and you follow that. I, I mean, we were talking about um, the scholarships so in one of the earlier panels. Um, that's a great way for us to uh, improve the education levels of uh, of the communities around us, and that's um, you know I didn't before coming here I didn't know about that um, that uh, scholarship program. So that's you know I learned something today. So that's just a way that we'll continue to improve our our sustainable vision for all of our operations. So, John. Well, I mean, it, for you know to meet social requirements, environmental requirements for mining to be sustainable. We have to be innovative. It's implicit. I said that earlier. Um, you know, when I started into this role, as I said, I was first on the ground in 2013. The engineers, the mine, mine planners, I, I told the guy, you, you have to start thinking outside the box. We have to think about mining differently. Uh, we have to think about the environmental components, the social components up front before we look at it, just the sole economic components and then find a balance and strike a balance. Um, we went through a process with an engineering, environmental, social team where we went through over 50 iterations of our mind plans, our designs, before we settled on something that met all of the pillars and, and all the requirements. So the, the, you know, the regulatory requirements uh, 
are not getting any easier from a um, permitting perspective or, or, or similar. And we have to improve our footprint, our communications, our consultation, our partnerships to ensure that mining continues to be an, a cornerstone of, of British Columbia and its economic, economic success. Great. Well, we have a few minutes left. Um, and we are standing between you and the wine and cheese reception. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give us some closing comments around innovation and what they see in the future. So we'll, we're going to start with John because we made you wait to the last to do your presentation. So over to you. Well, I think, you know, the, the last two days, I've, I've listened to some really interesting panels and some really interesting talks. Um, you know, innovation is, is very broad. I think uh, the comment today about innovation is not somebody punching on a keyboard in a basement somewhere. It's, it's, uh, it's much more than that, and we've heard that today, and, and uh, I've learned a lot. I mean, the previous panel was very interesting, and, and I think, you know, the, the changes we're seeing from a federal, provincial perspective in terms of reconciliation uh, and, and working and, and training and, and education within our First Nations, I think that's, that's another main cornerstone to, to you know, all of our success, and, and um, as I said, ha you know, innovation being a, a key component of that, and communication and dialogue as part of that innovation success, I think has change, changed the future and changed the way uh, we move forward. Thank you, Terry. Final thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm I'm excited um, to to be operating in Canada. I've been working away in the in the U.S. <laughs> And uh, where, where mining is, is um, not really central to the economy, and uh, if anything, it's sort of vilified as, a, as this you know, environmental disaster. And, and uh, um, anybody that I meet and uh, you know, asks, hey, what do you do? You're, you know, I'm a mining engineer. Oh, you're a horrible person. And I, I mean, I, I probably know more about protecting the environment than um, 99 people out of 100, um, and yet I'm a mining engineer. So. Um, Anyway, I'll digress. But uh, it's good to be in a uh, pro-mining um, uh, country and a pro-mining province. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm learning um, every minute that I'm, I'm in British Columbia, I'm learning more about uh, how to operate here. Um, meeting people like Chad is, is really exciting uh, to learn how we can uh, be more sustainable and, and, uh, and partner uh, more strongly. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm I'm optimistic for what we can do with Silvertip. I I think that um, the more innovative we get, uh, uh, the better that operation is, and the longer it'll last because it'll just be such a a good business that we'll just keep reinvesting, um, keep exploring, keep looking at other opportunities in British Columbia. Um, so I, I think that that's um, sort of fundamental to the whole cycle. Um, so that, those are the things top of mind. Right. Well, we're certainly excited to have Core Mining and you back in British Columbia, so mm. thank you. Thanks. Chad, some final comments? Well, I think when we talk about innovation with, uh, you know, BC or the federal government, I, I hope that we get to a place where something like uh, cumulative impacts and uh, really honoring uh, land use planning and doing land use planning together with, uh, with First Nations becomes a, a major priority. I think we have a lot to to teach um, other governments, and I think sometimes it would actually take a lot of pressure off them if First Nations were making the decisions around things like wildlife management, uh, fisheries management sometimes, uh, you know, things like the grizzly bear ban and stuff like that, that, that have a situation in Tautan territory where we have almost more grizzly bears than ounces of gold because there's so <laughs> many of them up there. It would take a lot of pressure off the government if we made those decisions. So I hope we can work closer uh, with them and, and make innovative relationships there. When it comes to, uh, to industry, like I said, working closely in partnership, you'd be surprised how having a close partnership with, uh, with First Nations can, can really make your lives a lot easier when you're dealing with government, when you're dealing with investors. And, uh, the amount of knowledge and loyalty that they bring to your uh, your projects. So, um, continuing to, to make innovations there. I think when we talk about uh, reconciliation, which is this buzzword that everyone talks about, um, I think we need to, to 
as a leadership, focus on reconciliation internally. That's something people don't talk about a lot. We need to, to do the work internally. It's almost like when you talk to your, your shrink and they tell you you need to focus on yourself and figure out yourself before you go and have a good relationship with others. Uh, we need to do that as well. And we need to you know, create innovative ways to communicate with our people and um, you know, with, uh, with our neighbors and with our First Nation brothers and sisters as well. And I just want to end on a, on a quick joke because, uh, well, it's not a joke, but it's funny. Um, <laughs> innovation. We talk about First, Na First Nations will support mining when mining supports First Nations, and we talk about the benefits and the jobs and the contracts and all these pieces. One of the things that I did when we got into, um, when our team got in, and we talked about what to do with some of these, uh, these revenues that were coming from the province because as many of you know, 37.5% of the tax revenue that comes from major projects goes back to the First Nations group or groups that are impacted. And what we did was 10% uh, of our portion as Taltans goes back to all of our elders that are 65 and above. And what I tell people is, never before in the history of Taltan Nation have the elders been more um, curious about the price of gold and copper than they are now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's innovation, and uh, that's what I'll end with. I like that. And Charles, final word with you. Uh, yeah, I'll keep it short. I think uh, from everything that I'm hearing, the risk is to not innovate. And that's really the big takeaway I'm taking from this. Forum. You know, there's all these uh, opportunities in the province and across Canada. And, uh, you know, if we don't innovate in the way we communicate with each other, if we don't innovate in the way that we approach projects, that we create sustainability, and if we don't innovate in, you know, how our companies are managed, then we risk, uh, you know, staying behind and becoming laggards and seeing more consolidation, global consolidation, and then we lose more control, and then it becomes a harder and harder uh, uphill battle. So think of that, the risk of not innovating. We need to innovate. So um, well said, Charles. I, I couldn't um, add any more to the topic, and I really would like you to join me in thanking our panel today for talking about innovation.